Well, we continue uh, our sermon series in the Gospel of Mark. We're nearing the end. Um, and as we think about uh, the text today from Mark chapter 15, um, it's about being abandoned. Uh, have you ever been abandoned or left behind somewhere? You know, a long, long time ago when I was in high school, uh, our football coach and his wife, uh, Bob and Diane, sponsored an exchange student one year. And uh, these were friends of our family. They attended the same church that we attended. And so we knew them pretty well. They were good people. And after the school year had finished, uh, there were three or four exchange students that had come to our small school in, in central Kansas where I grew up. And uh, before they returned to their homes, Bob and Diane invited them all to go on a cross-country trip with them. Uh, I don't remember exactly where they went. I think they went to the Grand Canyon and back or something like that. Um, and anyway, uh, Bob and Diane owned an RV. And Bob was driving through the middle of the night. Most of the people were sleeping in the back. And, and at one point, he stopped for gas. And as he filled up for gas, I know um, people outside of New Jersey fill their own tanks with gas, if you're not aware of that. And he went inside to pay. Back in the day, you actually had to go inside the gas station to pay. Anyway, after he paid, he got back in the RV, he got back on the road. A couple of hours down the road, as some of the students are, are stirring, waking up, they asked him where his wife was. Yep. <laughs> She had gotten out at the gas station to use the restroom, and he didn't realize it, and he left her. And of course, this was long before the days of cell phones, and so she just had to wait hours and hours, knowing eventually, hoping eventually he would realize she was missing and want to come back for her. Um, it's kind of like this, this meme that I found several years ago that I've always kept in Bob's honor. Uh, it says, Bob suddenly realized his wife had fallen off her horse, which was quite a relief to him as just an hour earlier he thought he'd gone deaf. <laughs> so I don't know what that says about inattentive husbands and jabbering wives, but it, it always makes me think fondly of my high school football coach. Diane was abandoned as an honest mistake, one that I'm sure she let him know all about. Um, she knew Bob would eventually come back for her, and it makes for a funny story. But what if you were abandoned for real, forsaken by someone you loved? That's not funny. It's deadly serious. Have you been there before? Our Savior has. And Jesus was forsaken on the cross. The Father turned his face away. Why? Because the wounds that marred the chosen one brought many sons and daughters to glory. His wounds have paid our ransom. This morning in our series on the Gospel of Mark, we finally come to the story about the death of Jesus. The moment that he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this is the climax of the story. The, the entire gospel has been building up to this point. Jesus had said repeatedly that this was why he had come. He had come to die so that we might live. To be forsaken that we might be embraced. And to have the Father turn his face away so that the Father could turn his face toward us. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 15 We'll be reading verses 33 through 39. If you're able, please stand for the reading of God's word. Mark 15, 33 through 39. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes down to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last 
The curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who had stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we stand in holy ground as we consider this text. The most tragic event in all of history, and yet the most beautiful one, because it is in this voluntary offering of himself for us in our place that Jesus saves us and reconciles us and, and uh, satisfies the judgment that we deserve for our sins so that you can show us your mercy and your love and your grace. Lord, encourage us from this text today. Uh, Lord, would we not uh, just hear good ideas, but Lord, would we encounter Christ uh, as we uh, hear his word this morning. Be with us, encourage us, and spur us on to follow you with joy and with abandon. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we'll consider first a turned face, second a torn veil, and third a truth affirmed. So let's jump into a turned face. Mark, along with the gospel writers Matthew and Luke, mentions that darkness had come over the land as Jesus was being crucified, and it lasted for three hours from noon until three in the afternoon. And at that point, Jesus cries out in a loud voice. He's quoting from Psalm 22, verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Lee did a great job in the sermon a couple of weeks ago making connections between Psalm 22 and the crucifixion. And I'd encourage you to go back and listen to that from a couple of weeks ago if you didn't hear it. I'm not going to repeat everything that he said, but I do want to say this. By quoting this psalm from the Old Testament, this lament, the psalm of lament, Jesus is both expressing his utter grief at the intense pain that he was experiencing from being separated from God. And at the same time, he was declaring his commitment to God. Both his grief and his commitment. He is calling God, my God. Right? This is an affirmation of faith. It's an expression of intimacy to call someone my John, my Susie is, is affectionate, it's personal, it, it signifies there's a relationship there. And biblically speaking, this is covenantal language. God promises throughout the whole Bible, I will be your God personally, and you will be my people. And so for Jesus to cry out, even on the cross, and refer to God as my God shows that he's keeping faith, as it were, even in the face of total rejection. And as Lee explained in his sermon, in quoting from Psalm 22, Jesus surely has in mind the rest of the psalm, which ends in a cry of victory, the cry of victory. And so by, calling Jesus, or by, by Jesus calling God my God, and by quoting from a psalm that begins in abandonment and ends in victory, Jesus is both expressing the agony of his experience on the cross as he's separated from his father, and yet at the same time is certain of ultimate vindication and victory. He asks this question, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He knows the answer intellectually. He knew why God was abandoning him. That was the purpose of his coming to earth. He had repeatedly explained it himself numerous times leading up to this, um, this event. But now, now he's actually experiencing it. Something that he has never experienced in all of eternity. So what was he experiencing? What was happening on the cross? Well, in short, we could say God turned his back on Jesus. The darkness that came over the land was a sign of God's judgment. Uh, the gospel writers make the point, um, um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke make the point that this darkness occurred between new, noon and three o'clock, right? It couldn't have been a naturally occurring eclipse because an eclipse can only happen during a new moon when the, the moon passes directly between the sun and the earth, but the Passover was always during a full moon. So it was impossible for it to be a naturally occurring eclipse. Furthermore, no eclipse blocks out the sun completely for three hours. 
This was, quite simply, a special act of God, a miracle. This is not the first time that God has miraculously brought darkness as a sign of judgment. He did it as one of the plagues during the exodus uh, on Egypt when he had Moses stretch his hand out over Egypt and, and darkness spread over the land for three days except where the Israelites were living. A miracle of judgment. Similarly, in Amos chapter 9, uh, Amos prophesies, In that day, declares the sovereign Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. The darkness signified that God is pouring out his judgment for our sins upon Jesus on the cross. The intimate fellowship that the Son had always experienced with the Father from all eternity was broken as the Father turned his face away. In many ways, this is, this is a bottomless mystery uh, we can never fully comprehend But scripture explains that Jesus was being made sin for us, made a sin offering for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. Scripture explains that on the cross, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a pole. He was being pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities as the Lord laid on him uh, the iniquity of us all. In short, Jesus died to pay the penalty for our sin. The father turned his face away, turned his favor away, turned his intimacy away from Jesus so that his face and his favor and his intimacy could move toward us who trust in Jesus as the sacrifice that takes away our sins. So what's the answer to Jesus' question? Why did the Father forsake him? For us. The answer is for us. The only way that God could lavish his love on us was for God himself to pay the penalty for our sins. Friends, this means that if you have faith in Jesus... God will never, God can never abandon you. Stephen prayed just a few minutes ago that for many of us, this has been the darkest year of our lives. Sometimes we feel like God isn't there. We often feel forsaken or perhaps totally in the dark. We wonder, is God there? Does he care if he is? Sometimes it seems as if our prayers go unanswered, just bouncing off of the ceiling. Have you been there? God abandoned his son precisely so that he could never, will never abandon you. Therefore, it's impossible for God to abandon anyone who's trusting in Christ. Jesus promises himself to always be with us to the very end of the age. He promises to never leave us or abandon us. So we feel abandoned sometimes. It's dark. We wonder what's going on. God, are you there? But Our feeling of abandonment is not because God has abandoned us. Perhaps it's because he's not giving us our way. Perhaps it's for other reasons that we don't even know. We may not always know what God is doing, but because of the cross, we know for a fact there is a purpose beyond our understanding that God is up to. Jesus himself trusted in God when he was truly forsaken by God simply because God was worthy of his trust and his devotion and his commitment. And so when you and I feel abandoned, we can pray. You know, Jesus, if you took real, actual abandonment for me so that I wouldn't have to, I know that I cannot truly be rejected. And so, Lord, help me. Help me, Father, to trust in you Just as Jesus did, knowing, Jesus, that you are always with me. You're always present with me. In your darkest days, God is there. He cares. You know that because Jesus was forsaken far more than we would ever experience. Uh, We can't be forsaken because he was forsaken in our place. 
Jesus' death shows us the Father turned his face away from Jesus so that he would always turn his face towards us, his people who have faith in Jesus. Second, a torn veil. Immediately when Jesus breathed his last in verse 37, verse 38 says, the, temple, uh, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Uh, this is a reference to this, this huge and heavy curtain. It was 60 feet high, 30 feet wide, and it separated the holy place in the temple from the innermost sanctuary called the Holy of Holies, or the most holy place. And this Holy of Holies was a symbol of God's presence. It was decorated like the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden, of course, was where God put Adam and Eve at creation. It was a sanctuary a safe place, a place of God's presence where they could know God face to face. They could experience complete fulfillment in God's presence. It was paradise in the presence of God. But after they sinned, they were cast out of the garden and God placed angels called cherubim, the scripture says, with flaming swords to bar entrance back into the presence of God, to guard the way into God's presence Later, though, when God established his temple in the midst of his people, the innermost place, the Holy of Holies, is decorated with flowers and trees and cherubim, like a little Garden of Eden. It represents God's face, his presence, his special presence in the midst of his people, and yet it was still guarded by those cherubim depicted on the curtain and inside the Holy of Holies on the ark no one could enter except the high priest once a year when he brought a blood sacrifice for the sins of the people. And the blood, of course, signified death. It, it signified that sin had to be paid for. It was, it was only a symbol pointing forward to the way that God would truly remove the barrier. A life would be forfeit in order to pay the penalty that we owe. Hebrews 9 and 10 is an extended explanation of this. It explains that Jesus is both the final and perfect high priest and the final and perfect sacrifice. And everything about the temple symbolized him and what he was going to do. And so Hebrews 9:12 explains that Jesus did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. Jesus' blood actually secured forever what that annual sacrifice of the high priest symbolized and pointed forward to. And because the work to forgive us was finished by his death on the cross, the curtain in the temple that separated us from the very presence of God was torn in two from top to bottom at the moment Jesus died. We now have direct access to God by faith. Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 23, explains, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. There's a lot there. But the point is, Jesus has removed the obstacle. He's removed the barrier. And we now have direct access into the very presence of the throne room of God. Imagine. We can enter God's presence with confidence. If you're a follower of Christ, if you're trusting in him, you have nothing to be ashamed about. Your guilt is washed away. Jesus has made you clean and you individually and together, God's people corporately are now the temple of God, right? He comes and makes his home in us by the Holy Spirit, Jesus says in John 14. Paul says in Ephesians 2 that each one of us is a living stone built into a spiritual temple in which God dwells by his spirit. All of this is made possible by Jesus' death on the cross. We have access. 
It's another way of saying God is accessible to us. Brothers and sisters, the encouragement is that we draw near to him with a sincere heart. Right? That means that you can do life with God. He lives with you. Do you, do you, uh, do you acknowledge that? Do you, do you engage in that throughout the day? He's always there. You can pray to him about the challenges that you're facing. You can pray to him about the celebrations that you're experiencing. Uh, this is not just a theoretical doctrine. God is with you. You have access into the presence of God. He lives in you and with you. Brothers and sisters, do we avail ourselves of this? Does it affect the way you pray, the way you think, the way that you go about your day? That's, that's the beauty, the privilege that he has opened up for us as he tore the temple, uh, tore the, the curtain in the temple. Third, we see a truth affirmed. Immediately after describing the tearing of the temple, uh, the curtain in the temple, Mark describes the experience of this centurion that's standing in front of Jesus at the foot of the cross. And he surely had witnessed the death of many criminals. He's a centurion, he's moved up the ranks, he's been around the block a few times. Uh, and, and he saw something completely unique in the death of Jesus. Something that he had never seen by any of the other executions that he had witnessed. You know, perhaps he watched puzzled as darkness overcame the land while his men were gambling for Jesus' clothes. He saw how Jesus conducted himself in the midst of all of the mocking and all of the abuse that he was experiencing. He must have heard the Jewish leaders speaking amongst themselves, scoffing at Jesus' claim that he was the son of God. He saw Jesus crying out to the Father, faithful even in his suffering, in his darkest hour. And he experienced the earthquake that split the rocks and opened the tombs that Matthew describes in his gospel at the death of Jesus. And then Mark records, when the centurion who stood in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man is the son of God. It's striking to note the contrast between this man's response and everyone else that day. Uh, Lee went over this uh, a couple of weeks ago, but the disciples who had been taught by Jesus for years were still utterly confused and discouraged. The religious leaders had heard Jesus teaching. They had seen his miracles and they rejected him. The onlookers joined in the mocking and they saw in Jesus' death a spectacle for their entertainment. Even the criminals, at least initially, uh, joined in their mocking. But then we see this outsider, right? This hardened soldier of an oppressive empire. Uh, this man who was a pagan, he probably was in charge of having Jesus beaten and mocked and killed. And it's this man who declares, surely this was the son of God. In fact, he's the only human in all of Mark's gospel that makes this declaration. Peter recognized him as the Messiah. Demons recognized him as the Son of God, but no other human acknowledges that. And with this statement, Mark's gospel comes full circle. The very first verse of chapter one tells us who Jesus is. Mark begins his gospel saying the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. And then everything that follows prompts us to ask the question, who is this Son of Man? Right? Who is this man who can teach with such authority? Who, 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 can, who has authority over storms and sickness and demons? Who, who has the audacity to claim to forgive sins? And who can raise people from the dead? Who can walk on water? Who can multiply bread and fish to feed a multitude? All of this has been moving towards this confession. Surely, this man is the son of God. It's unlikely that the centurion fully understood the force of what he was saying unless he had been in contact with Jesus prior to that. That's certainly possible. Christian tradition recognizes uh, that he became a follower of Christ 
Um, we don't know for sure, but the point of Mark's gospel in placing this statement immediately after the ripping of the curtain is, the, is, is this. The point is that the way is now open to God for anyone. The way is now open to anyone. Anyone can come. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done or where you're from. It doesn't matter if you're a pagan or an outsider. The Holy Spirit is working in the hearts of all kinds of people. There's hope for anyone. And this is the purpose for Mark's gospel. This is why he wrote this gospel, to bring us to this point. If you confess Jesus as the Son of God and Savior of sinners, you have access to the innermost sanctuary, the very presence of God. Will you see how Jesus died like the centurion and confess with him that Jesus is the Son of God? If you've never done that, but you're at this place like the centurion that you're ready to do that, I'm going to pray in just a moment to close out our, our sermon time. And I'd invite you to pray along with me the prayer that I'm praying and, and let it be for you a profession of faith. And if you do that, make sure to tell me after the service. I would love to follow up with you and help you take next steps in your journey of following Jesus. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that we thank you that you turned your face away from your dearly loved son in judgment so that you could turn it toward us in blessing. Thank you Jesus that you willingly died in our place tearing down every barrier that keeps us from the presence of God so that we can live with you and the Father forever. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that the Father and the Son now live in us by the Spirit. And so, God, encourage us by your love and your sacrifice for us. Lord, reassure us that because you forsook your Son, God, you will never, you can never forsake us. Lord, give us the grace to call you my God, even in our darkest days, knowing that in the end all things will be made right, knowing that we will dwell in your presence with joy forever because of the work of your Son. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.